Okay, um, welcome Nicholas and welcome um, uh, Zach. This is the week eight webinar. And the plan today, to, um, we're doing chapter 10, which is actually not one of the harder chapters. Um, I tried to mellow it out a bit because you had tests this week <clears throat> and there's a project coming up. So in terms of the materials today, it's not that bad. Um, so the plan today, we'll talk about conducting a hypothesis test for comparing two different populations or two different survey questions from the same population. That happens too sometimes. We'll look at proportions and we'll look at means and we'll look at those hypothesis tests. The ideas behind everything we're doing, we really did last week, okay, except for a couple little items because we talked about hypothesis tests last week. Then what the plan is, is I will be um, talking about the project. Project two is due in a while. In fact, um, what's the date for that? So project two is due on June 16th, which is a few weeks from now. So I guess two weeks from Sunday, but it's time to start thinking about it. So my thought is, again, this is a bit light a week after the midterm, now that the midterm's over for, for all of you. Um, so the plan is I'll have time to talk about the project. So just a couple notes. Um, one is you took your midterm and I have not graded it yet. I've kind of looked over some of the ones that came in yesterday, but I haven't really graded them, um, but I'll find out. And my plan is tomorrow and Friday, possibly tomorrow I'll finish. If not, it'll be Friday I'll finish hopefully. And then I'll have them posted. Um, your grades will be posted up on the, uh, your grade book on campus. And we'll also have, um, as soon as they're all in, I have to make sure I, get, I have all the tests, I'll post the key to the midterm so that you can look at the midterm and see, you know, what the right answers were. If you need to see your particular answers, I can do that, but it's a lot of work to send everybody a PDF. I'd have to scan them every in and then send emails individually. But if you really need it, I can do that um, and get that to you. Uh, I can much easier actually not get the graded one, but the ones that Proctor sent to me. But I have to wait until um, I've, returned, I've received every midterm. And in fact, I have a student just outside. Um, I'm actually personally proctoring it and she's taking it right now. She'll be finished in a little more than an hour. Um, so that is the plan. Are there any questions, um, Nicholas or Zach? Any questions? So I don't see any questions in your... Okay, let me talk about um, chapter 10. I like to, if I can, and I usually can, I'm going to pop in a news article. I'm going to use it from Gallup and we're going to analyze it. So, and oh, just to note, by the way, this is the one week, the only week of the quarter where there is no discussion forum that's assigned. And again, this is midterm week. So it's very different. So it's a lighter week in terms of other work because it's a heavy week for the midterm because that's a big deal. So um, you're not going to do the discussion forum. That doesn't mean that you don't need to understand this stuff this week. It just meant I'm trying to make it a little lighter for you. So I am going to pop in an article and let me share. Okay, so this is an article from Gallup. And what it says is, Postal Service, still American's favorite federal agency. I'm not sure if it's your fa favorite or not, but according to Gallup, it is American's favorite federal agency. Hopefully by now you know that Gallup did not, does not know for certain that it is the favorite federal um, agency of all of Americans, okay, because I hope you know they didn't survey everyone. Either of you get a survey? Either of you get surveyed by them? Yes or no? Okay. I have yet had anyone say yes to that question in all my years of teaching. Okay, because again, they had, it turns out, they surveyed uh, 1,024 this year and 1,016, uh, 1,024 uh, people this year. So they surveyed 1,024 people. And again, there's 300 million people in the world, in the country. So 
definitely, it's pretty unlikely that they know about everyone. But we have learned from hypothesis testing and confidence intervals for a single population proportion or mean, you can, even though you don't know about exactly what Americans think, you can get a pretty good um, educated guess on it. And that's what they're doing. So I wanna look at some of the data and we're gonna see if they're right. So we have a hypothesis that Postal Service is America's favorite federal agency. And what they asked is how would you rate the job done, okay, the job being done by whatever agency it is, and would you say it's doing an excellent, good, or only fair or poor job? And what we want to do is we want to say, well, is the Postal Service really the top in America? Okay, so the first thing we need to do is we need to form my hypothesis. Okay, and let's look at, let's look at number two, and that is uh, Secret Service. So we got Postal Service versus Secret Service, and that's what I'm going to be looking. I'm not going to look at all the different agencies. We'll just restrict to those two because we can do that. And the question is, is the Postal Service, do more, do, is there a higher percentage that think the Postal Service is excellent good than the Secret Service? Any questions on that idea? All right, so I'm going to switch my share because I want to start writing. So let's go ahead and pop into my paint where I can write. And what we can say, as soon as I get this popped in, that black slide. is we're gonna have an H naught. Now what we're doing is we're comparing the Postal Service versus Secret Service. And notice that there are two unknown population proportions, and we wanna see if they're equal or if Postal Service is higher. So in that case, we no longer have P as a number. Now we have P and for the Postal Service, let's just call that P1 for Postal Service, is equal to P for the Secret Service. So let's call that P2. Okay, for H1, the alternative hypothesis, we have a P1, but now we're gonna to wanna to find out if people think that the Postal Service is better than the secret service in their job, in how they perform the job. So better means greater than P2. Any questions on this idea? Any questions? You'll notice this is really similar to the chapter nine stuff. The big difference is that now we have a P1 and a P2 instead of just a proportion that we're comparing to a number. Nick, Zach, and Charles, Charlie, does that make sense? Any questions? Okay, so next we need to go and we need to see what they've done. We need to get their, we need to get their data. So let's go ahead and let me do a new share. Let's go back to the article. So the first thing, it was a 74% versus 69%. The next thing, and this, um, this took a little work to find, is this is the original article, and they said that they surveyed 1,024 adults. Any questions so far on that? So that was the, sort of the data collection. That's a lot of work. They put some time in it. We don't have to. We can just read what they've done. And notice that if you go 0 0.74 times 1,024, you get um, rounded to 758. And similarly, if you do the same thing with 0.69, again, you can use a calculator for this. I'm using actually Google. 
you get 707. And again, these are rounded. You'll notice they actually add to 1,025. So it's called 1,025. Uh, oh, no, they don't. They, it's not what they add to. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, so now what I need to do is I need to see what the p-value is. And again, we're used to doing this when we did hypothesis testing for one variable. Now we have two variables. Not too much different. So I need to do a new share and go to my calculator. Okay, so here's a calculator. Now you're used to this. We're going to hit stat. Then we're going to go tests. Okay, so now this is going to be a new test. Any guess on what test we're going to use for this? Two prop intervals. See, intervals are for confidence intervals. Yeah, two prop Z test. So two because we have two survey questions. Prop because the survey question is a yes or no question. Do you think that the postal service was excellent? And do you think that the um, secret service was excellent in the job they do? So that's a yes or no question. Um, the sample size is definitely large enough. We have 1,024 and our X's were 758 and 707. And if you look at the people who said no, that's definitely more than five also. So it's big enough to use a Z. And it's a test because I passed this test. Any questions on that? Okay, so next, I go down to two prop Z test. <coughs> so X1, that was our 758. That was the number of people who think that the Postal Service is doing an excellent job. N is 1,024 for N1. X2 was 707. And in this case, um, they asked 1,024 people for both questions. It doesn't have to be the same, oops, it doesn't have to be the same um, number for N1 and N2. But in this case, it is. Except I'm not. Let me get one more time. One, zero, two, four. Good. Any questions on using the calculator? Okay. And again, um, you definitely need to use your calculator on this. In fact, I noticed just in glancing at the tests uh, at the at the midterm exams, some of you aren't like using these nice features of the calculator. There are some of you that are like doing the whole thing by hand in some miserable way. Um, why would you want to do that? So I strongly recommend you use calculators. One thing, you don't, run, don't want to run out of time. The other is it's much easier, and there's fewer mistakes to make. Okay, next, our hypothesis was that P1 was greater than P2. So I go to P1 greater than P2, I hit enter. Color I never care about. Your calculator probably doesn't have a color, so don't worry about it. And then I hit calculate. Any questions so far? Okay, so the hope is that you can read this now, even though this is the first time we've ever actually done this, but we can read this and know exactly what the result is. And what is the key item that the calculator gives you that's gonna help us to decide how to make a conclusion. Yeah, it's P. Okay, in this case, P is 0 0.006 about. Any questions on that so far? Okay, so now let me go back to the paint because now I'm gonna have to do some typing. So we know Ah, so let me tell you what that is just a minute. P was equal to 0 0.06. And let me go back to the calculator so I can answer your question about the P hats and tell you what they are.
Okay, so here it is again. There's a P1 hat and a P2 hat. P1 hat, notice, is 0.74. That was a percent of, Amer of the sample who thought that the Postal Service was excellent. The P2 hat is 0.69. That's a percent of the sample that thought that the Secret Service is excellent. Does that make sense, Charlie? The third P hat is, I think it is the average of the two. And it's a weighted average, but in this case, it's the same sample size. But the main number here is the P value because we're running a hypothesis test. The P1 hat and the P2 hat, actually, we already had those. We started with those to get X's. But the P value, that's the important one. So let me go back. And we need to type our conclusion. So let's go to the conclusion. Okay. If P is 0 0.006, what can you say? What does that mean? Any thoughts? Zach, Nick, Charlie, any ideas? Because we did this last week, it's the same idea. Yeah, but in particular, and it's really important that you get the wording right. And that is there is statistically significant evidence. that the population proportion of Americans who um, think that the Postal Service is doing an excellent job is higher than the population proportion of Americans who think that the Secret Service, whoops, who think that the Secret Service is doing an excellent job. Are there any questions on that? I want to note something that's really important. Okay, in there's some key words that are required in this class to when I ask you to state the conclusion. One is statistically significant evidence. Okay, if you don't put those in, I take off points. At this point, um, that would have happened in the midterm, it's too late for that. But the final exam, you're gonna have to do this again. So don't don't make that mistake. If I ask you to make the conclusion about the hypothesis test, you need to start with there is either statistically significant or statistically insignificant evidence. Next, you have to have the word population or you have to be able to refer to all Americans. If you just say Americans and you don't know whether it's the um, population or the sample. So you have to specify that you're talking about the population. Any questions on that? Any questions? Um, yes, the final exam is cumulative. Okay, so the final exam is definitely cumulative, but it is going to be more heavily weighted on chapters 10 through 13. But any chapter is fair game, but 10 through 13 will definitely be on it. Hopefully that answers your question, Charlie. Okay, so any questions about this? Okay, again, that is the um, conclusion. And then similarly, if I asked you to interpret the p-value, you would say that if you conducted another study of 1,024 Americans, and um, it was 
and the proportion of all Americans who think that the Secret Service is excellent is the same as the population of all Americans who think that the Postal Service is excellent, then there would be a 0.6% chance that we would end up with a sample proportions such that the um, the proportion of Americans who think the proportion of the sample who thought that the postal service is doing an excellent job is at least five percent more than the proportion of the sample who thought that secret service is doing an excellent job. Where did I get the five percent? Any thoughts? Key is in the calculator. So let me reshare. Notice that P1 hat was 70.74, P2 hat was 0.69, those differed by 5%. So remember that the P value is a probability that if they were the same, that you would get a difference as big or bigger as what we got, and we got 5% difference. Any questions on that idea? Any questions? Make sense? Okay, and similarly, let's say we used a 5% level of significance. I didn't even mention it because our p-value is so small, but if you have a 5% level of significance, that means that if we were, if the proportion of Americans of all Americans who think that the Postal Service is doing an excellent job is the same as those who think the Secret Service is doing an excellent job. And we did another study of 1,024 Americans. Then there would be a 5% chance that we'd end up falsely concluding that the proportion of Americans who think that the Postal Service is doing an excellent job is greater than the proportion who think the Secret Service is doing an excellent job. So I'm saying it kind of quickly because it's exactly the same as chapter nine. Any questions at all on this? Okay, let's do some more examples and these are more stock examples, but they're important too. So let me to remove this unless you have questions. Okay, so let me go and pop another question in. Okay, so here's the next question. And it says, are left-handed people better mathematicians than right-handed people? What do you think? So are left-handed people better at math than right-handed people is a big question. And how would you come up with figuring out if that's true or not? Hopefully you all know, given this class. I don't see y'all jumping in, but hopefully you can. Give you a moment, take a drink of water. So how would you find out if left-handed people are better at math? Any ideas? All right, well, I think I'll just say it. I'm hoping you tell me in your chat box or talk about it. So what you would do is you conduct a survey. So let's say we conduct a survey of 35 lefties and 40 righties. And we gave them a, the survey is actually not a true survey, it's a math test. And we see who does better. Okay, and let's suppose the lefties scored an average of 
with a standard deviation of 13%. The righty scored an average of 68% with a standard deviation of 13%. Any questions so far? Okay, so what I want to do is I want to write down the null alternative Abbasis. So let's start with H naught. Okay, so for this one, the survey question here is what did you score on the test? It's not a yes or no question. Is that clear? Okay, the survey question is not are lefties better than righties? The survey question is what did you get on the test, on the math test? So because of that, we're talking about quantitative data and we have a mu. And I'm going to go mu L, which is mu for the lefties. And then we're going to say equals mu for the righties, which is mu R. Any questions so far? Then we're going to have NH1. And if the lefties are better, then mu for the lefties should be greater than mu for the righties. Any questions on this so far? Okay, so the next thing I need to do, and you're used to this, is I need to go to my calculator. I need to find out what is the test statistic and the p-value. So let me go and get to my calculator. So we can clear out what we had. I'm going to get a stat. Then I'm going to get a test. What test do you think we need now? Yeah, this is a two SAMP t test because there are two different populations and we're looking at quantitative data. Okay, notice the sample sizes are large enough. 35 is bigger than 30 and 40 is bigger than 30. So let's go to our two SAMP t test. Our input is stats because I have our I have the statistics. The X1 bar, that was a mean of lefties, and that was, I'm going to use 72, 72%. I can use the whole number there. It works easier. Our standard deviation was 13. The N1 was 35, because that was the number of lefties. X2 bar, that was the mean for the righties, which is 68. Their standard deviation was 13 also, just happened to be the same standard deviation that could happen. The sample size for the righties was 40. We have mu1 is greater than mu2, that's what we want, so that's good. So for this class, Pooled is always no. Got it? Okay. It's a little complicated, and I'd say over 90% of the time, in terms of the real world, you're not going to do a pooled sample. So it's just going to be no. It's not worth in an elementary stats class to go over what that means or anything. So just remember to put no in your calculator on pooled. Color never matters, and I calculate. Any questions? Any questions? Okay, so now that we have that, let's look at our test statistic. What is the test statistic? Because I asked you for the test statistic, or that's what the question asked for. So what is the test statistic here? Yeah, that's the 1.329. Notice that's not very big. Remember, an outlier is greater than 2. So our p-value is 0 0.09, right? It's a pretty high p-value. So now let's go back and let's write down some conclusions.
All right, so first thing, our test statistic. Let's do that in text. Test statistic was t equals one point three three about, and our p value was p was equal to um, zero point zero nine. Any questions on that? Okay. We're using a level significance of 0 0.05, because that's what part B says. What's the conclusion? See if you can type out the conclusion. Nick, Zach, Charles, let me know what the conclusion is. Yeah, there's statistically insignificant evidence. There's going to be more, but that's a great start. So let's write that out. So let me go back to this. There is statistically insignificant evidence to make a conclusion. about whether the population mean, notice that population mean needs to be there, um, math test score for lefties is higher than for righties. Any questions at all on this example? Okay, just a note, the p-value is 0 0.09, so that would mean that if the population mean was the same, and if we did another study of 35 lefties and 40 righties, then there would be a 9% chance that the lefties of the sample would score at least 4% 4, 4 higher than the righties, because that's how much higher they scored in this example, in this, um, in this survey. Any questions on that? And similarly, if the lefties and righties were the same in their population mean test score, and if we did another study of 35 lefties and 40 righties, had them take a test, then there would be a 5% chance, that's the level of significance, that we would end up falsely concluding that the lefties um, have a higher population mean score than the righties. Any questions about this example before I move to the next one? Any questions? Okay, so now I'm going to erase this because I need to. So I have the room for the next example. Okay, so here's our next example. What it says is, are people better listeners if they do not have use of their eyes? So if you close your eyes, are you gonna like listen more? 
Okay, so what they did is 12 volunteers were first given 100 words to remember while they were looking at a, the person speaking. Okay, then they were given 100 words while blindfolded. Each time the participants were asked to write down as many of the words as they could remember. The table below shows the outcome of the study. So again, we got these people that were looking and these people that were blind, blindfolded. Any questions about the study first? Okay, it turns out that this is different than the last example in a very important way. In the last example, we had lefties and righties, and that first lefty had nothing to do with the first righty. There's just random people selected. On the other hand, we have people that are doing both. First, they're tested with their eyes open, and then the same people are tested with their eyes closed. Any questions about kind of the way this study is working? All right, so now what we want to do is notice that because it's the same person, this is not dependent data. I mean, this is not independent data, this is dependent data. So that's the first thing I think I want to write that out because it's really important. And it is one of the hardest parts of this chapter. This is dependent. Because this 14 and the 17, these first numbers, they're the same person. Dependent data comes when it's the same person answering two questions or doing the same, doing two different things. It's also, for example, if you wanted to compare, let's suppose the weather in the temperature in Los Angeles versus the temperature in San Diego. And you looked at 50 days and you looked at the temperatures in those two places in those 50 days, that would be dependent also because for each day, you get two different answers. Instead of a person, it's a day, but it's the same idea. Okay, so if you have, if you kind of arrange it where these are matched up, then we call this a dependent, dependent samples. In that case, we're gonna treat this very differently than we treated the last ones. So the first thing is I wanna write down my null and alternative hypotheses. Uh, actually, I need to do it with pen. So we have H naught. And that is that I'm going to write mu d is equal to zero. Anyone guess what d might correspond to? What that stands for? The hint is it's the first letter of a word. What word starts with d that this might be? Data, not quite, not quite. Dependent, that's a good idea. It's actually difference. It's the mean difference. Because we're taking a difference between looking and blind and seeing if you get zero or not. Because if being if having your eyes open or having your eyes not open is the same, then you should get zero, right? For a mean, for the difference in the means. Okay. Or the mean difference is the way to really say it. Similarly, H1 is at mu d. Notice that if you, we want to find out if they're better if they do not have use of their eyes. Well, if we take looking minus blind and they're better blind, you get a negative number, right? Because the blinds are bigger or can remember more words. You take looking minus blind you get a negative number. That makes it a less than zero. Any questions on how I came up with the less than zero? Okay, so the next thing I need to do, and you're used to this, get my calculator out. 
So let's go to our calculator. Okay, so it's clear what we had. I am going to go to stat. This time we have data, so we need to put the data in. So I'm going to go to edit. You've seen this before. Okay, I'm going to clear for L1. I need to get rid of that. But I have an L2 also. I got to clear that. So the L1 numbers were the looking numbers. And I know you can't see them more, but you have to trust me, it's 14. Oops, 14. And then 23. And then 15, 37, 4, 19, 22, 51, 37, oops. And then 18, 16, and 22. And then L2, that will be the blindfolded group, the uh, blindfolded tries. That's 17. And then 25. And then 20. Then 37. 3. 29. 24. 53, 35, 20, and 19, and 22. Any questions so far? Any questions? So again, I just put the data in. We have two different um, rows of this table. That's why you can have an L1 and L2. All right, so the next step is a little bit different than you've seen before. So I'm going to quit. So second, quit. Now I'm going to do the following. I'm going to go second, L1. Then minus second, L2. Because I'm subtracting the survey answers. And then I'm going to store that in. That's a stow button. Second three. Then I hit enter. Okay, so we've stored the differences into L3. Any questions on what I just did on the calculator? No, this is very different than anything we've seen before. Okay, so now I'm going to go back to stat. I'm going to go to tests. This might be a little tough. What test do you think we're going to use? What test do you think is the best test to use here? Okay, it's a good try, but it turns out that we're subtracting looking minus blind. And when you subtract, you only have one sample, the sample of differences. Does that make sense? So we're actually going to use a regular t-test because we just have our sample of differences. It's one sample. Even though we started with two, once you subtract, we only have one. Then we hit enter. Here I have data. Our mu naught is zero, okay, which it'll almost always be zero when you're doing what's called a paired test or a dependent sample test. And that's because you're just checking to see if they're the same. If they're not the same, one's bigger. Okay, so most of the time, you're gonna have a zero for that one. Our list is gonna be L3. So second three for the list, because we've stored the differences into L3. Uh, don't worry about freak, keep that at one. We wanted to see if the differences were less than zero. So I go to less than, and then I go to calculate. Hit enter. And there we have it. We have 
The test statistic is negative 2.4 about. Our p-value is 0 0.02. So what do you think? What does that tell you? Any thoughts? Charlie or Zach or Nicholas? <coughs> yeah, there is statistically significant evidence because the p-value is less than the standard 0.05. This is definitely a 0.05 kind of um, test because they're finding out if um, there's a difference in in remembering remembering numbers when you're blindfolded or not. It's not the end of the world if you're wrong or anything. So it's just typical psychology kind of thing. And psychologists always use 0.05. So now I'm going to go ahead and take a look and see what we can say. So notice again. Our P. Value was 0 0.02, about 0 0.018, I guess. So now what we can say based on that. is there is statistically significant evidence that the population mean, notice that word population mean, that needs to be there. Um, number of words, people can remember is greater if they are blindfolded than if they're not. Any questions on this example? Okay, one of the hardest parts is to notice that this is paired because that 14 and 17 is the same person doing two things. And that makes it paired. Always check that. It's also, we're only doing paired data if we have uh, quantitative variables, not the yes, no question. So any questions at all on this example? Okay, what I'm gonna do is, I think this is a good time for the secret word and then I'll talk about the project. In fact, today, is unique is that the secret word is not a secret word. I know that sounds weird. Do it in green, make it bigger. The secret word is two. Okay, any guess on why it's two? I would try and Make the secret word something you wouldn't guess, but you can see why we're using it. Paired, or actually any of the examples we did, because we're talking about two different collections of data, whether they're two paired, or whether they are two independent, or even two proportions, yeses and nos. So it's always two. Any questions on anything from chapter 10? Do you agree this is very similar to chapter nine? Same idea stuff. Um, yeah, there's no discussion. Um, there's no discussion um, assignment. I'm trying to be easy on you that way because you, you had your test this week. So it's a lighter week because it's, it's a heavy week because of the test. But I do want to talk about the project. That's the next thing. 
because we do have some time. And that is that one, I think. Is it that one? Just one second. No, it's that one, actually. OK, so here's Canvas. And I like to go from the syllabus. There's a few ways of getting there. Syllabus, I think, is easiest. And what you're going to do is you're going to get a project two. Any questions so far? Let me double check something. Uh, 23. Yeah, good. That's, that worked. So notice it's due on June 16th. It's a big part of your grade, so take it very seriously. And project two is basically this chapter. Okay, it's all about chapter 10, um, but you have to know all the old stuff too. So what you're going to be doing on project two is the same beginning, which means get a partner. And check to make sure your partner is still in the class. We have lost a few people, not everyone, but we have lost. And you don't have to keep the same partner. You can change partners if you want. If you didn't get along with your partner, please change. No reason to you know, battle again. And if you did get along and, they're still, and you're both in the class, or all three of you in the class, then there's no reason to change. You might as well stay with the same. So that's the first thing, have a partner. The next thing you're going to need to do is you're going to need to come up with a hypothesis. Okay, and the hypothesis has to be a hypothesis test for the difference between two means. So that could be independent or dependent, that's your choice, but it needs to be quantitative and you're comparing two means. Okay, and I gave you, and the last two examples we did were examples of comparing two means. Any questions so far? What I recommend, strongly recommend doing, is as soon as you and your partners have come up with your idea of what your hypothesis test is going to be, at that point, post it. Post it in the Project 2 discussion board. And I'll look at it and let you know if it'll work for this project. Any questions on that? Okay, so you're ready now because you now know what it means to have a hypothesis test for the difference between two means. That's today. Any questions so far? Okay, so again, you're going to post that. You're going to post your null alternative hypotheses. And that's great. Okay, so. Um, the next thing you're going to need to do is get your data. Okay, once it's a good project, you're going to get your data. This is not project one. That's a big note. Okay, it should not be difficult to get your data. <clears throat> There's very little requirements. You are allowed to use convenience sampling. Okay, as long as you admit to it, you won't get, take, you won't get points taken off if you use convenience sampling. As long as you admit to it and talk about why there might be some issues. Um, I won't take off points. I will take off points if you don't admit to it. Or if you say there's no issues, I use convenient sampling, and that's perfect. Because it's not. Okay, but you're allowed to use convenient sampling. You don't have to conduct a survey. You, you're welcome to gather data that is already available. Okay, but it has to be a sample from a larger population, a much larger population. Otherwise, there's no reason to do a hypothesis test. If you can get the whole population, then there's no reason to do a hypothesis test or a confidence interval, which we're doing also. Okay, so again, your population should be very large and your sample should be greater than 30. Okay, and it might be two different samples if you're doing an independent samples t-test then you're going to have two samples, each greater than 30. So that'd be a total of 62. Okay, or more is fine. Any questions so far? Okay, you should, just like before, I don't know if I wrote it in, but you definitely should. Um, you should think about who might be interested so that you can address that in your paper. Because it's very important to have a tone of this is why we care. These are the decisions that are going to be made. 
because of it. If no decisions could be made based on your project, then it's probably not a good project. Any questions so far? Okay, you should explain your sampling technique, but again, it can be anything. Um, it can be, it doesn't have to be people answering questions even. So for example, um, I don't know if we had anyone there, I was there. Um, did you get my note about snapshot day? About two weeks ago, I think, a week and a half ago. You remember that? I sent a announcement about snapshot day. Okay, so we went and collected data, okay? It's already been collected for you. You could just grab it, okay? And that's available, for example, on, um, I think it's the Keep Tahoe Blue people, and they can get you the data for you, and that's fine. You don't have to, like, do a survey. You can collect data. As long as it's data in which you can't get the population, there's no way of getting every single stream and creek in every location that feeds into Tahoe and get the data for everything that's ever happened. Forget it. And you might compare last year to this year, for example. Does that make sense? Okay, so data's fine. Okay, as long as you can't get the population. So if you get the population, it's worthless to do a hypothesis test because you know the population. You don't have to hypothesize about it. Okay. Um, so once you have collected your data, then you are going to go into the spreadsheet. And as I've mentioned before, I made a spreadsheet program that works for these projects really well. You can use another one, but this one is like designed for this class. So this is easier. Okay, so here's a spreadsheet. And just a note, it's going to pop this up, and you can use the same spreadsheet. It's the same one you used last time. If you already have it on your drive, then it's there. If not, you can, you can go get it. But it's not the first tab, it's the second tab. It's the two VAR stats, because you're doing a comparison study. So I just have a sample. We have firsts and seconds, and you're going to type in your data. First thing you have to do is erase the old data. And then you're going to type in your data, whatever that might be, 34, 23, 18, 17, 40, whatever it is, et cetera, et cetera. You can type in your second, which is the L2, basically, 26, 71, 22, 40, and I don't know, 33. Just making up numbers, whatever your data is. Okay, then it does everything for you. Okay, but one thing you have to do, oops, one thing you have to do is you have to be able to look at the data and understand what it says. So in particular, notice that there's difference independent, and then let's go over here to column N and O, and you'll see difference dependent. So the computer doesn't know whether you mean independent or dependent. That's something you have to look and know. And then you're gonna, that, those are your statistics. So the important statistics will either be these guys or these guys. Okay, depending on what your study is, whether it's independent or dependent, and you get to choose. You could do whichever you'd like, but you have to like do it right. Any questions so far? Notice that the, the computer has a p-value for two-tailed, right-tailed, and left-tailed. Again, the computer doesn't know what kind of test you're doing, so you just look at the p-value that's right. It even gives you a test statistic, and it lets you choose your level of confidence. So if, if you want to choose the 95%, you go 95, and there it is. That's very independent data. And that'll give you your confidence interval. And you are required to do a confidence interval for the difference. And what you can do is you can actually look at the 95%. You could look at the 90% and see which one works better for you. Okay? And that you're allowed to do afterwards, 
because there's a trade-off. If you get a 90%, then you're less confident, but you have a smaller margin of error. If you get a 95%, you're more confident, but your margin of error increases. So you're required to take a look and decide which works. Any questions about these? Okay, I also require you, remember in project one, you had to write a full paragraph about the standard deviation? In project two, you have to write a full paragraph about the standard error. So again, here it is, okay? And by the way, standard error for dependent difference, that would be that one, which is different. Okay, so you have to do that. You have to talk about that. This is not project one, so you don't have to look at all of the statistics, but you should probably look at the uh, mean difference, whether it's dependent or independent, it's still, that's the number. So in this case, it was negative 12. I just made up numbers, so that's an important one. The rest are not so important, but you should look at the mean. And again, the standard error is the biggie. Let me go back to the requirements. Okay, what I have learned is that the standard error is the most difficult part of this whole project. Okay, how many of you, the three of you here, um, are really comfortable with the standard error? Say yes or no, I'm comfortable with the standard error or it's confusing? And again, it's not the same as standard deviation. What do you think? Is it an easy concept? Yeah, I found, I found that most people find this pretty confusing. So what I did is I created a video on it. Video. It's a almost 15 minute video about the standard error where I talk about the things you should be thinking about for the standard error for the project. Okay. Any questions on that? I'm not gonna like play it now, but I'm gonna let you listen to it. Again, this is on campus so you can get to this. If you go to the project two requirements, you click on project two from the syllabus, it'll send you here. Then you just click on the video and watch it. It's also on YouTube. Any questions on that? Okay, just like project one, the whole point of this project is to use your data to make recommendations to your client, okay? You don't need to explain how the values are, what mathematics was done to arrive at all the numbers. That's not what you need to do. In fact, you, you're not doing the mathematics. You're letting the spreadsheet do the math for you. What you're supposed to do is talk about why, what you can say and what you can explain to your client on strategies and things that they could do in their organization based on the statistics that were shown. And the specific ones, not in general, but you got this number for the standard error how is the client going to use that number and what decisions will the client do because of that number? And same thing with the confidence interval. You got the lower and upper bound of the confidence interval. For those numbers with the lower bound and the upper bound, what decisions and actions will the client make? Same for the hypothesis test. Okay, based on the conclusion of the hypothesis test, what decisions will the client make? Based on the p-value, what decisions will the cl cl client make? You should talk about the type one and type two errors first before you conduct the hypothesis test, okay? The decisions on level of significance comes from the type one and type two error issues. You need to talk about that, okay? Then after you find your p-value, then only one either type one or type two error will be relevant and then talk about it again, revisit it. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, and if you have questions about any of the, you know, ideas of the statistics, post them on the project two discussion board and I'll help you out or you could help each other out too. Any questions so far? Okay, again, you're gonna interpret the Hypothesis test, the confidence interval. I recommend paragraphs for each. Don't get them confused. Don't put, the, don't put the confidence interval for the difference in the same paragraph 
as the hypothesis test for the difference. They're very different. So make sure that those go in different places. Okay. The standard error should go everywhere because that's the main point of this whole project. It should be talked about individually, but independently. It should be talked about when you're looking at the confidence interval. It should be talked about when you looked at the hypothesis test because it's used in different ways for each. Okay. Um, okay. Um, you should also talk about the assumptions you're making um, to find your confidence interval and p-value. Okay. And don't forget assumptions and conclusions are not the same thing. Okay, Discuss, talk about why you care or why, you're, why your client cares. And talk about future studies that could be done. Any questions? This is a project two. Okay, I have similar rules. So again, if you go back to the syllabus, in terms of a timeline, so number one is partners. That should be done now, okay? Now that you're done with the midterm, make sure you're satisfied with your partners. If not, get new partners, but have a partner. Post in the Project 2 discussion board if you're looking for a partner, okay? If you want a third person, or if you want to join a group of two, or if you're by yourself and you have no idea, um, post, I need partners. Okay, so that's important. So that should be done again right away. Then I would say, um, Within the next five days or so, strongly recommend that you post on the project to discussion board what your idea is, what your hypothesis is. Okay, your null and alternative hypotheses, and I can help you out whether that works or not. Okay, then next week, after you are good with it, then go get your data. It could be a survey, but it doesn't have to be. It could be go finding data. Okay. Then once you found data, then you're going to pop it in the spreadsheet. That's really fast. Again, you have to have more than 30. If you're doing independent samples, that means if you're, if you're doing people, for example, it's 62 data values. Okay? If you're doing one person with dependent, still 62 data values, but it's 31 people or more. I wouldn't do 100 or 200 because that's too much typing. Okay, then what you would do is write out your draft. So write out your full draft. And notice the project is due the 16th. But just like project one, if you send me your draft in advance, okay, by Wednesday, Wednesday night, then I can take a look at it after you send it to me and give you suggestions. Um, it's a first come first serve basis. So if you send it on Tuesday, you're more likely to get a really quick response. It takes me a while to read these and to type out the responses. Don't expect me to you know, do this in five minutes because I got to read your whole paper and then give you the full response. Okay. Um, so anyway, that is the timeline. And then my recommendation, just like project one, is to have your project submitted. I recommend the 15th, even though it says the 16th. That way, if some disaster happens, you got another day. Okay, that's just a good life skill, not just for my class. But whenever there's a deadline, I recommend a 24 hour in advance to make it happen instead of the deadline. Just to give you a, an example of that, um, I had to submit a grant proposal. We're writing a grant to create a homework system for preparatory college algebra. Again, nothing to do with this class. It's due tomorrow. Any guess on when I submitted it? Yeah, I submitted it today and it worked, but it was, you know, online anything. You never know when something's going to go wrong. And if, if something went wrong and I wanted to do it at the last minute, it's too late and I don't get the grant and it's $20,000. Okay. That's just a life skill. You do it a day early. If something goes, if something went wrong, I could have called the people that were responsible and say, oh no, help me out. Okay. Fortunately, I clicked and everything worked. And I went, yes, done. Okay. So there's no reason to wait until the very last day because there's, there's nothing to gain by waiting to the last day. 
again, it's a life skill. So that is pretty much what I have to say about the webinar and the, the project, Chapter 10. Next week, we're going to move on to Chapter 11. Um, next week, we're going to be um, we're doing what we haven't done before, and that is handling qualitative survey questions. So we've only done with the yes, no, and we've done with um, quantitative data. Now we're going to deal with things like a survey question where it might be, um, what state were you born in? And it's not a yes, no, it's not a number answer, it's a word. You know, I was born in California. I don't know about you all, but that might be, uh, it's a word answer. Okay, you might have been born in Pennsylvania. So that's next week. So again, it's something we haven't done yet in this class, and we're going to that. But for now, um, that's all I have to say, but I'm happy to answer any questions, Nicholas and Zach and Charlie, that you might have. And again, I'll get to grading tomorrow is my plan. Okay, thank you, Nicholas, for, for showing up. Again, we ended up with three, but you were the first, so that was real helpful. Any other questions, um, Charlie or Zach? Uh, I don't do extra credit, but the key is you've seen how the test is. And the X credit, of course, is the, um, the last question was X credit, question 10. I don't know if you noticed, but that was an X credit. I hope you answered it, because that's the only X credit in the whole class. Um, but everything else is a um, is regular credit. The final exam is a big part of this class. So the most important thing, Char Charlie, is make sure you practice writing out problems so that you can succeed on the final. Otherwise, it, this class won't go well. But um, So I'll be posting the midterm, the key. But I recommend actually just looking at the question again. Try writing again and then look at the key. So I don't do extra credit, but there's plenty of stuff left. And the project is 15% of your grade. So make sure you do really well in the project. Don't wait to the last minute on that. OK, other questions? Okay, you two have a good night. And any questions, um, Zach? You've been pretty quiet lately. Any questions? If there's no questions, then I'll say good night. Okay, good night. And um, for all of you who are um, watching this as an archive webinar, um, thank you for watching. Don't forget the secret word is in somewhere. And um, it's short, that's a hint. So um, I'll be checking the Q&A forum. I'll be checking the Project 2 discussion board also, and be happy to answer any questions you have. And I'll be um, grading the midterm and give any feedback. So please, um, you know, be patient. It does take me a little while to grade, a day or two, but I'm not a procrastinator, so it'll, by the end of the week, it'll be graded. So have a good one. I hope everyone did well, and I will um, communicate with you all week, and we'll have a webinar next week, earlier in the week, because there's no midterm next week, so we don't have to, we don't have to wait until it's over. So have a great one, and good night.